You were saying that, that females or elderly people with higher cholesterol are, are having better rates of uh, not mortality. And uh, what is going on there? The short answer is we don't know. Okay. The speculative answer is there are certainly many things that LDL particles, the same particles, these same boats that are carrying the LDL cholesterol, serve a purpose for. And that's something that gets ignored quite a, bo- quite a bit. It's a bit frustrating because they have an immunological role, very prominent one, and they have a reparative role. So let's take the immunological for just a second. For one, they carry an antioxidant. A lot of people know it as vitamin E, okay. but its uh, technical name is alpha tocopherol. Okay. And actually, there are a lot of uh, ferols and phenols that are associated with this as an antioxidant. But its presence in the bloodstream means that as it gets more and more contact with free radicals, it can help neutralize them and turn them into a non-reactive product, Mm -hmm. right? But on top of that, and while this is a bit still new, and I myself am exploring it with my own research, there's the reparative aspects. And there's some lipidologists that will insist that there aren't any reparative aspects to LDL particles. I push back on that. And in fact, I actually did a recent experiment where I specifically kept everything I ate the same, tried to keep my sleep the same, tried to keep my exercise the same, except for two intervention periods. And in those two intervention periods, I did an enormous amount of uh, weightlifting and a lot of exercise, basically any way I could to make myself sore, to basically induce a level of reparative, uh, a a reparative event, I guess you could Uh say, throughout my body. Uh And as I hypothesized before I did this experiment, both times you can see my LDL slowly dips down into this nice little curve, coming back up to the second intervention, and then dips down again. What am I speculating is happening? Something that we call endocytosis. Mm -hmm. Endocytosis is when a cell is actually engulfing something. And in in this case, we're talking about LDL particles, receptor-mediated endocytosis of an LDL particle. Now, why would I speculate that this was so important? Well, actually, LDL particles... Their hull, as boats, are made up of phospholipids and free cholesterol. Now, what do you suppose the membrane of a cell is made up of? Maybe phospholipids and cholesterol? That's correct. (laughs) That's correct. Don't get me wrong. It has other carrier proteins and many other things. But the bulk of a cell's membrane are those two ingredients. How handy is it that if you had a house and you were stuck at your house, that a Home Depot truck is driving by every second that has all the materials that you need to fix your house. It's handy. Now, unfortunately, what they'll say right now is, well, cells can make all that they need. And it's true. Most cells can, for example, synthesize their own cholesterol. But it's expensive. It's actually very hard to make cholesterol. There's 30 steps in the biochemical process, right? So why wouldn't you go ahead and use, if, if the body was making available, that material that you need? Because the single biggest thing that you're going to care about as a cell is your superstructure. The point is, again, as an engineer, I can't help but come back to this over and over again. Why would the body make something that is actually detrimental to itself? Period. And I feel like one of the most obvious clues is you look right there on a cell membrane and it has a receptor that like a lock and key is specifically for LDL particles and specifically for endocytosing them, for grabbing a hold of them and engulfing them, bringing them inside. And once they're brought inside, they can be pulled apart for everything that's part of their contents. So not only are they getting the phospholipids and the free cholesterol, they also get the fat-soluble vitamins, they get the antioxidants, any of the number of other things that they might be able to make use of. But they like to speculate against it because, to use a legal term, I feel like they consider cholesterol to be fruit of the poisonous tree. What, they, what, what fruit of the poisonous tree means in legal terms is, let's say somebody breaks into your house, the cops break into your house, and then they you know, catch some illicit materials there. They can't use that against you because they didn't exercise a warrant to do so, right? So to take it back to cholesterol, it seems as if anything that results in cholesterol being in your blood for any amount of time inside of an LDL particle ends up being something that will get villainized. Therefore, any value that an LDL particle could have in your bloodstream, such as an immunological role or a reparative role, gets de-emphasized. I kind of have a problem with that. 
because that's what could make sense as to why those people who are elderly could experience a benefit from higher, having higher levels of LDL cholesterol. This could help unravel that part of the story. We should be able to look at both sides. Last thing, you, you had already touched on this a little bit you, when you were talking about personal fat threshold, but you had been talking about, um, there was a phrase for this uh, type of person. What, what, what was the term for that and what can we learn from these type of people? Well, before I tell you the term, I should probably get you the predecessor term, which is those people go on a low-carb diet who see their LDL cholesterol jump up, like I did at the beginning of my research. They're known as a hyper-responder. Okay. Uh, I adopted that term for this phenotype because this phenotype is actually a subset of hyper-responders called lean mass hyper-responders. Mm -hmm. So if you think of a hyper-responder as somebody who might see their LDL jump to, say, 150 180 milligrams per deciliter. A lot of these lean mass hyperresponders will typically be at 200, even 250, 300. We've even seen some at like 400, for example. But they also tend to have other markers in common. They also typically have HDL cholesterol of 80 or higher. That's very high, very unusually high relative to anybody else. And they tend to have triglycerides, that other marker we were talking about, at 70 or lower. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised how many people have appeared that have had these three cut points in common. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Because the most common comment that we get from people who come to us and they go, it looks like I'm a lean mass hyperresponder. Mm -hmm. What can I do because I want to stay this way? I feel better than I ever did in my life. Yeah. And I actually have great blood markers otherwise. My inflammation markers are low, my blood pressure's down, I'm setting personal records in the gym, all these sorts of things. But by golly, my doctor has me scared to death about my high LDL. Now, we always say the same thing. We're not doctors, medical professionals, and we're not going to tell you we're certain about where this will lead. But I will say this, anecdotally speaking, the evidence is looking good for these phenotypes. They might be looking good for your brother. <laughs> because... As per the data I showed you with my own carotid intima media thickness in the, uh, the presentation, mm -hmm. I tend to see that a lot of these who are turning around their CIMT data, who are turning around their CAC, it's looking actually pretty impressive, even while they're running at these levels of LDL and LDL particle counts. Now, we need more studies to truly confirm this. But I think this phenotype is really the key, not just to this kind of diet, but also to really answer this larger question on the lipid hypothesis. Is it really true that in any context, high LDLs are deleterious? And I think they're the ones to show us the way. Either direction. Okay. And uh, la last point I want to touch on. Could, you had talked about CIMT. And uh, could you tell us what that is and what happened during your experiment? The, the experiment we talked about at the start. Absolutely. Okay. So the carotid intima media thickness test. What it is, is it's an ultrasound. And it's actually trying to capture both your intima and your media together. What its exact thickness is in nanometers. So it's very, very sensitive. And what they're doing is they're trying to catch it on your carotid arteries. It's on the left and right, and typically the common carotid before it branches out. When they do so, it becomes a good proxy typically for atherosclerotic burden. So in theory, the thicker it is, the more likely it is that you may be at risk for cardiovascular disease. Okay, so if it's thick, it's kind of like a, a squeezed pipe? Yes, like okay. the lumen is a little more narrow, okay. as it were. Okay. Now, I had started getting this test, because it's an ultrasound, it's, it's not that invasive. Uh, I started getting it about every six months, uh, about a year into the ketogenic diet. And I was excited to see that on my right side, uh, I was actually regressing, not progressing. In fact, your thickness is supposed to stay about the same or even get larger as you get older. And yet mine was going down. It was thinning. It was very unusual. But it was also doing... Yeah. It was also doing so on the other side. It was doing it on both sides, both carotid arteries, with every single test at every single six-month interval. 
Now, that happened for four tests in a row going to November of 2017, which was a year before this is getting filmed. Uh, six months later, happened to be at the very end of an experiment that I was doing where I was actually intentionally gaining weight, the weight gain experiment, which I was hitting a whole bunch of markers at the same time, lipids, and also capturing what happens when you go from a standard American diet to a keto diet, etc. But my CIMT test, my, my six-month CIMT test, was taking place right after that. I was kind of curious if it might move a little north on one or the other side. And it moved north on both sides. It thickened on both sides by quite a bit. It actually went from the lowest on both sides in the six months before to the highest on both sides right after that weight gain experiment. Wow. Okay, wow. What, what was your... Did you have higher triglycerides when it was uh, getting thicker? Did, or did you have that data? Uh, it's... Yeah, my triglycerides were higher. My insulin was higher, mm -hmm. which I figured would be a factor. Um, but also just being, I mean, it, it does tend to get associated with weight gain as well on, by itself. But it's worth noting, because some people brought this up, they were thinking that perhaps my original CIMTs that were every six months, that that might have been just um, weight loss. The truth is I was actually weight stable through almost all of that. So even though I gained weight on this very last one to where it went up on both sides, I don't think it will have snapped back once I return to that weight. I think there may still be, at least this is my hypothesis right now, I think it'll actually be a slow regression. Or at least I'm hoping it's a regression. <laughs> slow or not. <laughs> for, for your sake, right? Absolutely. Okay, I, th I think this is enough to, forever, wh whoever's paying attention should totally shift <laughs> their perspective on LDL and, and triglycerides and HDL and, and the importance of considering all of them yeah. together. And it's funny because I, I do feel like for the longest time I would focus on things like hyperinsulinemia and you know the value of looking at inflammatory markers like CRP and more and more I realized you know what a lot of these are just proxies that can be found in triglycerides and HDL. This is, it's actually a very power those two together are one of the most powerful measurements you can have. And they don't seem like it because they've been around for a long time. But uh, a good example, one that I like to use is, imagine you were a doctor and the only thing you had was a bathroom scale. You couldn't even see your patients. You could only see the number that comes back on the bathroom scale. Now you could, like LDL cholesterol, get a very loose association with a disease state. You'd go, well, this one came back 500. It's probably no healthy version of 500. What if you get one that's 280? Mm -hmm. How sure are you that that person is in a disease state that they're obese? Mm -hmm. eh, it's getting a little bit tougher. Now you see one that's 200? What do you do? So you could prescribe diet pills for people based on a bathroom scale, but that seems just a little bit short-sighted. Yeah. Let's say you had a choice between that or having a waist circumference measurement along with a height measurement together. Could you figure out a lot from height and waist circumference together? That's yeah, actually one of the best, best ways that you can determine all-cause mortality, the cheapest of the best ways. Yeah, your waist should be about half of your height or lower. And there's, there's a great study on that. Actually, Ted naiman has got some good work on that. But if you had to choose between those two measurements, well, it's a no-brainer. You go with the better measurement, which is the waist plus height. Okay. Well, so, again, I'm an engineer. Why wouldn't I go with a better measurement tool? If it turns out that HDL and triglycerides are a better measurement than LDL by orders of magnitude, well, then I want that measurement. Yeah. What I find curious, though, is there's not a lot of focus on getting that measurement. In fact, there's a lot of attacking of that measurement, mm -hmm. even without a lot of basis for it, mm -hmm. even though we have a lot of data sets that contain it. Yeah. But I don't know. I kind of feel a little bit suspicious that it's because there's not a lot of pharmacological ways to tackle it. Mm -hmm. Except Wonder Bread. Except Wonder Bread. <laughs> I've shown you sure. one today. You need the anti version of Wonder Bread. That's absolutely yeah. true. Yeah. What, what would that be? What, what would be, uh, for example, an anti Wonder, anti processed meat Wonder Bread diet? What would that look like? As in, how would I raise my LDL well, cholesterol? To, to get better, more healthy, healthy triglycerides in HDL. Oh. That's easy. Like, definitely whole food. Uh, I myself probably would be more on a meat-based diet, right? 
but certainly something with lots of micronutrients would be helpful. Yeah. But if you're keeping it just at the energy side, then yeah, I think you want to be powered by fat, but not excessively so. Okay. So for example, I, I'm not a fan of things like liquid or refined forms of fat in high mm -hmm. quantities, because when you do that, you can find a way mm -hmm. to get too much fat into the system. Mm -hmm. But again, this is where I love triglycerides as a marker, because again, that being the cargo, you're seeing that turnaround, seeing how fast they move. And let me, let me just mention, this is in both uh, uh, low-carb and in low-fat diets. So you can actually be a, a high-carb, low-fat vegan and still have low triglycerides, be very healthy. Good. It's not that much of a problem, so long as, so long as you maintain metabolic flexibility. I have a couple friends who are really... Um, high functioning, very active vegans, whole food plant-based diets. Mm -hmm. But to be fair, they eat all day long. Okay. They have lots of small meals. So in a way, they're kind of emulating the slow turnover of energy that's happening. And, and again, they, they may be fine. I try to be diet agnostic, but I do think that there's something to be said for speed of entry. Um, and this is something hardly anybody talks about, but I'll because you're geeking out with me, we'll, we'll chat for just a second. I think that a lot of times the reason refinement's a problem is because you're thinking about it in terms of how fast can you get energy into the bloodstream ahead of the endocrine system being able to respond to it. Okay. How do you beat out the leptin, ghrelin, you know, uh, all, all the different means by which your body's used to having a whole GI tract conversation that comes back to how it's going to manage how much energy it brings in, how much it doesn't. And, and I realize that a lot of people get excited because they'll see higher ketone numbers from things like having lots of liquid yeah. and refined forms of fat. Again, I, I just follow the data. I'm the guy that I am because, and I've gotten to where I've gotten by thinking of this human operating system, particularly from an energy management standpoint. Mm -hmm. And I don't get excited by high ketone numbers. Mm -hmm. I do get excited by low triglycerides. <laughs> Basically, I want to find efficiencies in the system. And the efficiencies aren't always as obvious as surpluses of energy markers, if that makes sense. In fact, it's usually the opposite. That's why I take a little flack for this, but I think that there probably is some overage level, and it may be very individually based on ketone levels. There may be a BHB level that's actually higher than you realistically can use in the uptake of your cells. But nobody ever explores that. We explore that for high glucose, we explore that for high triglycerides, but we don't explore that for high ketones because we just love ketones. And again, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I'm not trying to follow in particular camp. I keep coming back to it as what makes the most sense mechanistically. Yeah. And the thing that I keep seeing over and over again is in really healthy bodies, whether you're vegan, whether you're a carnivore, whether you're a Mediterranean, whatever, you tend to see lower triglycerides, you tend to see lower glucose. And that suggests that regardless, the body's getting very attuned to just how much energy to use and not much more, because that's what it's supposed to do for survival. It's supposed to be efficient and get better and better at being able to manage that. And yeah, in the case of ketones, I feel like a lot of people have a lot of liquid and refined forms of fat so that they can hit their macros. And God bless them. I know what they're trying to do there, because they're yeah. trying to because from their perspective, they're um, they're maintaining fat adaptation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I got to hit that seventy five percent. Yeah. Exactly. And I think if in order to do that, you're adding a lot of these things, I don't know that that's ultimately going to be a net benefit. Man, I'd, I'd love. I wish we had more time. I'd love to just keep <laughs> keep going. But oh, wh where can we have everyone find your uh, content? Oh, for sure. Uh, cholesterolcode.com is our site, uh -huh. and there's a lot of great tools there, particularly a simple guide for people to be able to learn more about cholesterol, especially on a low-carb diet. And of course, I'm very active on uh, Twitter, okay. Dave Keto. At, at Dave Keto. At Dave Keto. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. That was awesome.